Episode 147 of the Read to Lead podcast is brought to you in part by cloud accounting software FreshBooks, offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. The most important thing is to surround ourselves with the right people because the right group of people can make the worst experience fun and the wrong group can make the most exciting experience absolutely miserable. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now, here's Jeff. Hello there. So glad you're here. Welcome to the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth. We talk about things like leadership, of course, but also personal growth, productivity, career, business, marketing, sales, entrepreneurship, and more. It's personal growth that's getting the emphasis today as we talk about a book called The 2 a.m. Principle, Discover the Science of of adventure and we're joined in just a moment by the author of that book his name is john j-o-n levy l-e-v-y and i plan to ask john about how he defines adventure and why he feels it's a pursuit everyone should consider the key stages necessary for any worthwhile adventure Ways to bring a new level of adventure to your next date night and you can rest assured i'll be taking notes and a whole lot more And enjoying and planning even more of those date nights gets a whole lot easier when you're not bogged down in the minutia of work. And that's one of many reasons why I recommend cloud accounting software FreshBooks. Not only have I been a loyal user of FreshBooks since about 2009, they've been loyal to the podcast, having sponsored it since the spring of this year and just recently committing to 2017. So we're excited about that. And I'm excited about the fact that FreshBooks has been redesigned from the ground up and custom built for exactly the way you and I work. And I honestly believe it to be the simplest way you can be more productive, more organized, and ensure that you get paid faster from your clients. And the all-new FreshBooks is not only very, very easy to use, it's packed full of some pretty powerful features. You can create and send professional-looking invoices in less than 30 seconds. You can set up online payments with just a couple of clicks and get paid up to four days faster, like I was hinting at a moment ago. You can see when your client has seen your invoice, and that puts an end to all the guessing games, which I love. If you're on the fence, if you want to try out FreshBooks and all their features absolutely free for 30 days, you can do exactly that right now. Just go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. One more time, that address is freshbooks.com slash read to lead. John Levy is a behavioral scientist studying influence and adventure, and he specializes in applying scientific research to the world of business, using the latest in neuroscience and psychology to transform how companies approach things like marketing and sales, consumer engagement, and product design. He's the founder of the Influencers Dinner, a private community and dining experience in which 12 thought leaders and tastemakers across industries prepare dinner together. And he's the author of the brand new book, the one we're, of course, talking about today. It's called The 2 A.M. Principle, Discover the Science of Adventure. John, welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. I'm excited to have you here. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's my pleasure. First off, when I was reading sort of the press about your book and and some of what others had to say about it and and, and what publicists say and write and send, I wondered if if at first uh, you looked at the the word adventure as synonymous with hedonism. (laughs) (laughs) And so so first off, I'd like you to kind of describe or explain how you went about deciding how to define adventure, John, for the for the purposes of your research and for the book. Oh, absolutely. So I grew up, a, uh, just to give a little bit of background, I grew up really geeky. Uh, so mm. a super nerd, was into technology growing up, and back then there weren't any cool geeks. Uh, <laughs> so I'd have hero like my heroes were, you know, Indiana Jones and Ferris Bueller. <laughs> I, like, I considered their, whatever they were up to, kind of the adventures that I wanted to model. Mm. And I looked for a definition of adventure, and they all seem to come up short. 
especially compared to the experiences that everybody's having mm. either in these movies or books or in life. And so I had to create one uh, <laughs> that seemed to work for everybody because frankly, Jeff, what's exciting and adventurous for you might not be for me or somebody else. Mm. Uh, and so if, you know, there's certain things that I would never do like base jumping or I'm, I'm not into extreme sports, that's fine, but that's exciting for people and adventurous. So how do we encompass everything? Well, as I see it, an adventure is one, an experience that's exciting and remarkable. I think that that's really important because uh, as somebody who uh, imparts knowledge uh, to all of us, what you impart has to be remarkable. It has to be worth talking about. That's, as a, a species, how we've passed down our knowledge for millennia. Mm. Uh, two, it has to possess adversity and or risk, preferably perceived risk. Mm. <laughs> And this is really important as somebody who's been terribly injured. I was crushed by a bull in Pamplona. Ouch. Yeah, it was not a pleasant experience. There's a difference between perceived risks like going parachuting, which is very safe, and actual peril, which is like running of the bulls, like you're an immediate threat that mm. could really injure you or kill you. And then, uh, but the key is to have something to overcome, some kind of challenge. And then the third is it brings about growth. The person you are at the end is distinct from the person that started. Uh, and if you don't have that growth experience, it may have been a wonderful uh, experience of your own, <laughs> but it, it wasn't an adventure. Mm. And so uh, the definition is designed to be relative to each of our lives because what's remarkable and, and perpetuates growth for you will be probably different than me. Mm. Well, would you say then, John, that there, there's something in the book for everyone, regardless of, of their walk in life? I would, without a doubt. Regardless okay. of if you're an introvert and you prefer to stay in small groups and, you know, you enjoy a quiet night at home uh, reading a book. Well, so do I often. <laughs> but I, I read a ton. Or if on the opposite end of the spectrum, you're, you know, the most interesting man in the world uh, drinking Dos Equis and <laughs> you know, curing narcolepsy by walking into a room. Uh, the, the design of the book is to have uh, is that we took actual scientific research mm. in understanding how we as human beings behave. And that research could be applied for anybody mm. because we're all human. Well, I'm all about frameworks, and I would love for you to talk about this four-part adventure framework that, that you've developed, uh, generally speaking, at least at first, and, and then we can, we can dive into each one a little bit more, more thoroughly, if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely. So I believe that there's four stages to every adventure, or as you would refer to it, a framework, <laughs> which is actually a great word I've never used to describe it before. I'm probably going to steal that. <laughs> so the four stages are establish where you put the right elements in place so that anything can happen. So you get the right people together, you pick a location, you said, you know, all the basics. Then uh, the second stage is push boundaries. You cross some kind of social, physical, or emotional boundary. You have to grow, and this is your opportunity to do that. Then wherever you are, the, the next stage kicks in, it's increase. Mm -hmm. You maximize the emotional value of whatever environment you're in. And there's a series of characteristics you can apply to make that happen. And then the final stage is continue. And in the continue stage, you pick where to go on to next. The key is to end with style uh, because the end will be disproportionately remembered and there's all this research around why. So you either loop back through and you continue looping or at some point, the key is to end on a really positive note. And I like that the first letter of each of these spells the word epic. Very clever, very clever. Thank you. I had to, I literally went through about 50 different letter combinations to try to fi figure out something that would actually make sense for a book on adventure. It took forever. <laughs> I can imagine. I love it, though. So stage one is establish or putting the right elements in, in place, as you mentioned. Uh, and you hinted at some of these, but what exactly do we have to consider, John, to ensure we're doing that? So the most important thing by far, and this is not just for adventure, but for any aspect of our life, is to surround ourselves with the right people. Because the right group of people in an adventure can make the worst experience fun and <laughs> the wrong group can make the most exciting, wonderful experience absolutely miserable. Mm. But it goes beyond that. And I think this is uh, when you were asking, if, is there something for everybody? In this case, I looked at research by these two brilliant scientists named Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler. Mm. 
And the two of them were curious about the obesity epidemic. Is it something that passes to person to person like a cold, which would be very counterintuitive? Or is it a percentage of the population, kind of like, you know, Alzheimer's or something? Mm. And what they found was startling. Jeff, if you have a friend who's obese, your chances of obesity increase by 45%. Your friends, so me, somebody who knows you, mm. increases by 25%. That's just startling to me. Yeah, oh, it's insane. But it keeps going. My friends increase by 10% and their friends by 5%. Mm. And so everything passes through this social network of ours up to four degrees out. But it, this could be happiness. It could be voting habits, smoking, health. Anything you could imagine actually passes through our social networks. And so the most important thing you can do is curate the right people. Now, the second most important thing is selecting a location, preferably one that you haven't been to before. And the reason is that your brain actually processes novel and new things in a different way. Mm. And it entices us when we're exposed to something new and novel to explore so that we can understand it. Our brain literally goes into a state where it's trying to absorb new memories and create new neural pathways. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to get out and explore new places. The next two characteristics kind of go in, in tandem. I believe that it's important to have a mission, an underlying goal, mm. because it will guide the group and will drive behavior even through lulls and low points. But it'll also get outsiders involved to support you. And then paired off with that mission would be a set of constraints. So if your goal is to go grab drinks, that's not that interesting. It doesn't get you out of your comfort zone. Mm. But if you can't pay for your, any of your own drinks and that's the constraint you put in place, <laughs> then you have to get really clever in convincing people to buy you stuff or beating them in pools so that they owe you around. Whatever it is, you get to be really creative. And this is especially important when you don't necessarily have the option to go and explore new places every day. And I think this is lost on a lot of people. It's in the limitations that, that creativity flourishes, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's incredible. If you have all the options in the world, first of all, you're totally overwhelmed. And so by creating these constraints, you have to be really creative in the way that you overcome the challenge. Mm. So let's look at, uh, have you ever heard of the six word essay? Yes. So you have to write an essay in six words. It's in the limitations that we become creative or a haiku, right? right. It's when we put new constraints in place, we have to develop new ways to deal with them. And that in overcoming that challenge is where a lot of the fulfillment of the experience comes into play. Mm. Well, stage two then involves living a life outside your comfort zone, essentially, to always be, uh, as John calls it, pushing boundaries. That's, that's a topic that comes up often here on the show. Why do you think, John, so many of us are content with the status quo? I think that there's two or three reasons. One is that in order to push our boundaries, in order to grow, we have to be willing to be uncomfortable. And as a culture, we don't applaud people who do the uncomfortable mm. unless they succeed. They're essentially punished for it. They're either made fun of or they get you know, worse status at work. But if you go out there and fail gloriously, you're going to gain something from that. And so in general, we don't want to be uncomfortable. Mm. I mean, and it's so easy to be comfortable and pick up a copy of some celebrity covered magazine and watch The Bachelor. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's easy, right? Like mm. the, our entire culture is built to support that. Mm. Our cultural conversation is around that. And so I think that those who, of us who want to live exceptional lives have to embrace being uncomfortable and growing and pushing our boundaries and understanding that there might not always be the support that we want to accomplish that. Mm. And at the end of, uh, of it all, there has to be measurable change, right? You have to have grown from it. Right. So, you know, how do you measure personal growth? It's tough. But I would say that if you have an expanded capacity or you've learned a critical lesson from the experience, then you've grown. And for me, at least, What's far more important than having an outlandish story and really great memories, because a lot of the time those will fade or be replaced with other crazy stories, is that <laughs> at the end of the day, you are an expanded person with greater capacity. So when I walk into an office to give a presentation, there is 
nothing that could possibly intimidate me as much as that bull did. <laughs> And nothing that's going to be nearly as uncomfortable as when I went to Antarctica and set my trip's swim record in zero degree water. Mm. So because I've just had an expanded capacity. And if you look at the top people across business or uh, in social situations, they're I I don't want to call it callous, but they're they've just been through it. And so they know how to handle things with grace. They know how to uh, take pressure and how to handle clients and and employees and all that because they've weathered the storm. Right. You know, I've, I've tried to stretch and challenge myself in, in a similar way. Um, I do a fair amount of public speaking and in, in, that used to be something that I didn't like to do that made me very nervous, uh, despite the fact that I've spent, you know, two and a half decades in radio talking to thousands every morning. But being in, in front of a live audience was a, was a different animal entirely. And, and early on, I put myself in front of an audience of, of thought leaders and people I admired greatly and looked up to. And I thought, if I can get through that, if I can speak to that audience and hold my own, then I can, I can speak to any audience. Yeah. That's what, first of all, I applaud you because <laughs> uh, that's that joke that Seinfeld makes that people are <laughs> more scared of public speaking than dying right <laughs> so like you're better off being in the what is it casket than giving the eulogy exactly <laughs> so uh i very very much applaud you i think that mm. that's wonderful and i think that it's uh there's a, a bunch of stuff that i kind of learned while doing research in this book uh, for this book about this kind of stuff and there's something called the winner effect and it's really a kind of a funny quirk of animals in general mm. so let's say you have a success of some kind uh, your body will fl- flood with testosterone. And as a byproduct, you're prepared for the next battle mm. or challenge. And you have an advantage because you have a higher level of testosterone. And this will keep happening. So with every additional win, you stack more and more testosterone and giving you an advantage for the next challenge. And so if you can get even just like a small win, then you can keep stacking those, getting yourself more and more comfortable with larger and larger audiences. Uh, unfortunately, if you get filled with too much testosterone, uh, animals in nature spend too much time in the open and they get hunted or they get into <laughs> fights and get killed. Or in my case, what I did was I thought I was invincible with this bull and and it crushed me. Mm. <laughs> so uh, logic kind of goes out the window. But I think that that's really wonderful. And the key is in doing it in a responsible way so that you don't just throw yourself into an extreme situation, you know, giving a talk in front of 100,000 people. And then, you know, it scares you so much that you're traumatized and never want to do it again. <laughs> exactly. Well, in the third stage, increase or, or maximizing the, the experiential value of the environment you, you're in. John, how do the concepts of challenge and surprise and amuse and intrigue all come into play in, in this stage? I, I think the best example is, let's say you're at a dinner party with friends or you're mm-hmm. out at a bar or taking a hike with a group. What can you do? You have your mission. You have your constraints, whatever they are. But within that, what can you do to kind of liven things up? Because what's natural is that we'll end up chatting in a conversation. But if you want something truly epic, something that continues to push the boundaries of our comfort zone, then how do we accomplish that? Well, you could begin to use challenges to get competition going between the people in the group or with outsiders so that then they get involved. And now you have new people that are interesting that you can connect with joining you. You can use intrigue, which causes people to get pulled in and draws their attention and creates curiosity and engages them. You can entertain. And so if you're an amazing storyteller or if you uh, have some skill, I have a a friend who's a Grammy Award winning beatboxer. (laughs) One of the things that we'll do is that when we're in a group, we'll pick a song. And this guy used to be one of the Roots, uh, the legendary band. Ah. And uh, he'll beatbox and I'll sing. And it's, you know, it's super entertaining, but it totally (laughs) livens things up and it changes the mood in the environment because now everybody's engaged. Everybody's participating in the same thing. And then people begin to share their skills and it just makes it a lot more entertaining. Mm. And uh, it creates an engagement and bonding and a remarkability to the experience that otherwise wouldn't be there. Mm. Well, at the beginning of, of stage four of the book called Continue, there's a great quote that John includes from, from Joseph Campbell that says, we must be willing to let go of the life we plan so as to have the life that is waiting for us. 
John, talk about this last stage and how the mindset embodied in that Campbell quote plays into it. I think it's important that whenever we're looking at transitions in general, right, we've maxed out the experience wherever we are. And it's easy to fall into the pattern of going to the same places. Mm. Or, you know, I've bought movie tickets for whatever they cost now, 15 bucks. And so I'm hanging out with a group of people. I'm, my plan is to go to the movies, but I'm having so much fun or there's the potential to create something extraordinary. Just because that was my plan doesn't mean I should stick to it. Because if you have an opportunity to do something extraordinary, you should say yes. And Fandango will let you change your tickets. <laughs> will they? Oh, that's awesome. I didn't even know. <laughs> Frankly, I'm never anywhere long enough to be like, oh, I'm going to go to a theater. <laughs> so it's, you know, I've, I've, over the summer I was in 12 countries. I <laughs> think I'm not even sure I saw one film. I, I think it's critical that people don't get caught up with the way that things should be. Often it's expectations and plans. It's great to have them, but it doesn't mean that you have to stick with them and that you should give yourself the freedom to explore strange and different opportunities, even if they're not even if they're not going to be the most fun in the world. The variety of experiences and being the type of person that says yes to them far outweighs to me the the risks involved. Hmm. How has some of this impacted by, you know, life circumstances? I mean, let's say you're married with kids. Uh, well, how, how does that impact uh, some of these concepts and ideas? Uh, I think that the concepts stand, but the execution is going to be very different. Mm. I mean, first of all, if you have kids and that kind of responsibility, you're probably not doing any extreme adventuring uh, <laughs> that can get you killed. And that's a good move. <laughs> and, if, and if you are, please be very well insured <laughs> right. because those kids will need to be taken care of. Uh, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> But I think that you can continue the path of growth and exploration. Mm. It just might take on a different form. Uh, one of the things that drives me crazy, for example, is when couples who've been together for a long time have a date night once a week. Mm. And then the date night is going out to dinner. And I find it odd because if you're going to be in a 30, 40 plus year relationship, if you're not pushing yourself and growing as a couple, it might get really stagnant. Mm. And so instead, why don't you do something that's a little bit more thrilling and exciting? And I'm not saying dangerous, but go take a cooking class together. <laughs> create a guided walking tour through your street and create it for your significant other as a, a surprise, whatever it is. But like shake things up, assign a task and say, OK, we're going to switch off every Thursday night, date night. Each of us has to design and plan something original. Mm. And that's the deal. You've laid down the challenge. My wife and I do a weekly date day uh, that almost always includes lunch. <laughs> so well, it's important to eat. <laughs> I'm not saying you should starve yourself. Uh, but I think that it's, uh, first of all, that's a really wonderful habit. Right? <laughs> sure, like sure. It's, uh, and I, I applaud you for that. Uh, now, the question is, how can we spice things up a little? How yeah. can we take it to the next level? I'm not saying you need to like go bungee jumping. I'm saying... <laughs> Wherever you live, go the next town over. Mm. Go explore. Take a hike. Yeah, the, the first step for us in getting a little bit more creative with that, uh, or first attempt, was to go without a plan and to kind of make it up as we as we went along. And, and that prompted us to do things we wouldn't normally That's do great. or have thought of. Absolutely. Mm. And then the next thing I'd encourage is, if you see something that seems a little odd or interesting, just say yes to it. Mm. Even if it's money you weren't necessarily planning on spending. I'm not saying you should be fiscally irresponsible. But right. there's a point in the book where I'm in Stockholm Airport. It's like 5.17 in the morning. And I'm going through Duty Free. And the girl behind the checkout counter at Duty Free asks for my ticket to make sure I'm leaving the European Union. I'm leaving Stockholm and I'm going to Israel. And she sees that it says Israel and goes, oh, awesome, Israel. And I, I, for whatever reason, my response was, do you want to come? And she says, yes. <laughs> and I go, great, then come. And she goes, I'd love to, but I'm a grad student and it's really expensive. And I said, what if I paid for your trip? Mm. Now, Jeff, I didn't have the money to do that. <laughs> I, I didn't like, I mean, did I have the money in my bank account? Yes, but it wasn't anything like I budgeted that money for. Right. I was planning to keep that in my savings. But the moment I said it, like I didn't think when I said it, it was just like something that popped out of my mouth. <laughs> I knew I wanted to be the person who did it. Mm. 
And sometimes that's far more important than the logic and reason behind something. If I'm going to live by a group of tenants to make my life remarkable and extraordinary, it means sometimes saying yes to things I don't know how I'm going to accomplish. <laughs> I love that. I love that 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 way of of thinking. It's sort of the uh, do first, believe second yes. uh, uh, kind of mentality. I was uh, had a chat once with Seth Godin, and he said, "We don't take action because we believe. We believe because we take action. Do first, believe second." And I think that's that's similar to kind of what you're what you're talking about there. Well, um, I have a couple of questions for you, John. Not directly related to the book. But first, what else from the book would you like to make sure we know, if anything? The stories are completely outrageous. <laughs> uh, about a quarter of them, I just embarrass myself to an extreme degree. I was cringing when I was writing those chapters. And, uh, and I really wrote it in the hopes that it would inspire and enable people uh, to live a more exciting life. Mm. So I put it all out there about myself. And often I don't come out looking <laughs> the best, <laughs> but that's because it's far more important to me that we appreciate and respect our humanity and that we embrace the fact that we're going to fail at times. And that's just part of the human experience. Mm. But whatever people take away from it, I hope it inspires them and enables them to, to really live a more exciting life. Well, speaking of inspiration, uh, John, I'd like to ask you, what are the two or three books that come to mind that have inspired you over the years and maybe had had the biggest impact on you and, and share a bit about why they've had that impact? The first two that always come to mind are actually children's books. Oh. And they are The Little Prince by St. Zubay and uh, Peter Pan by James and Barry. Okay. And the reason is that they have a beautiful interpretation or view on on life and uh it's embodied so wonderfully in a story that that's inspiring and heartwarming in both cases the spirits of those books really i feel kind of affect me on a day-to-day -day basis and in fact because i have such a common name john levy is probably the most common name in new york <laughs> i added the letters tlb after my name so it's on my website on all social stuff and the reason is it stands for the lost boy Mm. inspired by Peter Pan and the Lost Boys mm -hmm. uh, because I've dedicated myself to living a life of wonder and adventure, much like those characters. And then I would have to say books that have had a profound impact would be the ones that focus on human behavior science. Uh, so if you look at someone like a Dan Kahneman, who really just changed the world uh, with his research, he wrote Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Mm. Uh, he redefined economics as we know it. And you redefine the way that we examine human behavior. And because of that, new fields were created. And that's where I get a lot of my understanding of social situations is because of that research. Well, good, good recommendations. Uh, we've never had The Little Prince or Peter Pan recommended on the show before. So that's, those are firsts. I, I like firsts. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, let me ask you, uh, lastly, what's, what's next up for you? I know the book is just out or just about to come out. What, what are you and your team working on now that, that you're excited about and looking forward to? I developed a behavior model for understanding how to engage highly influential people. And uh, for the past seven years, I've been testing it. So I developed this concept where uh, there are four characteristics that when you put them in place, influential people, captains of industry, thought leaders will engage with you. And I ended up from that creating a secret dining experience. Twelve people come. They're not allowed to talk about what they do or give their last name. <laughs> They cook dinner together, and when they sit down to eat, uh, they get to find out who they're sitting with. And mm. so it's a Nobel laureate, an Olympic medalist, the editor-in-chief of a famous magazine. And all these kind of captains of industry all get to come together. And so I've hosted over 800 people across uh, 100 dinners. And now I'm working on my next book on how to help anybody kind of create the network and community that can shape and impact the world. Well, I can't wait to read the next one. So uh, <laughs> you're, you're welcome back uh, on Read to Lead uh, anytime you like. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate that. And I want to thank uh, John Corcoran for uh, making the introduction. And thank you, John Levy, for being on the show. We appreciate having you and wish you nothing but success. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. This has been a great interview. So thanks for having me on. John is J-O-N Levy, L-E-V-Y. And you can connect to John on his website, John Levy, T-L-B for the Lost Boys, dot com. And he's John Levy, T-L-B on most 
social networks as well. All the links and resources we talked about, including more information on John's new book, can be found at the page created especially for this episode. You'll find that at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 147 for episode 147. Remember our sponsor, FreshBooks. Visit them and get that free 30-day trial right now. FreshBooks.com slash read to lead and be sure to answer read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. Finally, I want to say thanks to Pradeep who left our latest five-star rating and review in iTunes. In fact, we're only 10 or so reviews away from 300. Maybe you can be number 300 when you go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes right now. Not only would I thank you right here on this podcast, but I would also consider you awesome. That's going to do it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.